Okay, welcome everyone to today's CMS In Touch uh, webinar, Academics and Activism, Engaging with Social Change. And the webinar will be begin uh, will begin shortly. But in the meantime, if I can just ask you to use the chat to say hello, and um, just put your name and where you're joining us from, and just make sure that you select all panelists and attendees in the two drop down in chat, so we can uh, so we can all see it. And we'll uh, we'll speak to you in a few minutes. Okay, welcome to everyone joining. As I said, we're going to be starting in a minute or so. And um, whilst we're uh, getting ready to start, if I can just ask you in the chat to say your name and where you're joining us from. And a couple of you have done so, and um, but you've only shared it with the all panelists. So if I can ask you to say hello again, and just make sure that you drop down um, the menu so it says two, and it says all panelists then and attendees, and then we should all be able to um, see your greetings and uh, share our hellos. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to today's CMS In Touch uh, webinar and I know it's a good morning and good afternoon and good evening and sometimes good night to, to people as I can see people are joining us from all over the world and it's a real welcome to everyone. I don't know how everyone else is feeling but um, we're in the middle of term here uh, in, in the UK and it's just so lovely to be able to take some time to breathe and just listen to some really interesting people speaking about some really interesting ideas uh, that doesn't involve uh, teaching in, in any way. So lovely to, to see you all here. I'm going to um, I'm going to pass over to our host, which is uh, Ozan, uh, in one minute. Just a couple of uh, housekeeping things. Um, first of all, if I can ask you to use the Q&A function to ask your questions. Um, and you can ask the questions throughout the webinar. Um, just make sure that you um, put them in the Q&A rather than the chat. And Ozan will get to the questions when we get to the Q&A session um, towards the second half of the webinar. Um, secondly, um, if I can uh, invite you to use the, the Padlet that we have 
have um, created for this webinar. So what we'll be asking you to do is using it as a kind of reflective and collective place for you to share your ideas um, about the CMS community, uh, about the webinar with the CMS community. We'll be keeping that open for 24 hours after the webinar um, and Ozan will uh, discuss a bit more about what that's going to uh, going to lead to. Um, but in the meantime, uh, it gives me great pleasure to hand over and to, to Ozan, to Katerina, to Ernesto and to Daniel uh, for today's CMS uh, In Touch webinar. Over to you, Ozan. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. Uh, um, welcome all. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and also uh, this, uh, not seeing you, but feeling you uh, through the warm messages. Um, yes, uh, I would like to begin actually, uh, and first I would like to welcome all uh, again to this webinar, which is uh, about activism and uh, research uh, and how, uh, in which ways we can contribute to uh, social change efforts. Um, I also want to begin with, uh, uh, with, with, with uh, that um, Yustra and Hella, uh, they, we announced in the beginning, uh, they were going to be part of the webinar, but uh, since they are unwell, uh, they could not join us, but we welcome uh, Ekaterina and uh, we would like to thank you, Ekaterina, for the last minute step in uh, to share uh, her reflections and experiences with us. So thank you, Ekaterina, for this. And with this, I also would like to introduce uh, speakers uh, very briefly. Uh, I'm sure that they will also introduce themselves uh, in their time. Um, so we have four speakers, including me. Uh, so yes, first let's begin with Ekaterina because she is the first speaker and uh, she's from Lund University, uh, Environmental and Energy Systems uh, Studies uh, and uh, her research interests are uh, based on alternative organizations, alternative organizing work and plastics. And we have Ernesto from India, uh, Indian Institute of Management, uh, Ahmedabad, uh, and uh, he's uh, an expert in employee relations and labor relations. He's uh, doing some projects currently with uh, international labor organization, and he's uh, engaged with different businesses and NGOs uh, regarding occupational health and safety. Uh, and then uh, I will be the third speaker, uh, and uh, my name is Ozan, and I'm uh, located at Utrecht University. My interests are around alternative organization, uh, working with communities and community uh, engagement. Uh, and uh, finally, we have Daniel, uh, uh, last but not least, uh, and uh, he's from Nottingham Trent University. Uh, he is particularly interested in more democratic participatory and empowering organizational structures and organizational settings. And he's also an expert in alternative organizations, uh, and uh, he will also share his engagement uh, with various organizations in different roles. Um, with this, uh, I also want to uh, tell about Padlet. So this was uh, what I had seen in uh, a previous webinar in uh, racism. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I, I noted that there was a, a very high quality interaction between the audience and us. We can't see you, but as I said, we feel you. And this is another tool uh, to sense uh, what you think, uh, in which ways you can uh, contribute to this. Uh, discussions and um, uh, share your reflections uh, with us. So it will be online meanwhile. So it is also, you can see on the chat box that uh, there's a link. So feel free to add any kind of reflection comment to this Padlet and uh, it will be online uh, uh, for another 24 hours. And depending on the content and depending on uh, the material, perhaps we can share this with the uh, CMS community and other scholarly communities that as a kind of collective reflection of this webinar. And with this, without uh, losing much time, before uh, giving word to Ekaterina, I would like to very briefly introduce why we organize this webinar and what's the point, what's the objective. So simply we would like to share diverse practices of uh, engagement with social change and uh, we would like to share learnings uh, from these uh, engagements. Um, and of course, this discussion is not new, uh, which might be a bit cliche, but always, uh, I would say, uh, for, 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 a long, for a very long time, scholars and philosophers have understood the world, but maybe it is more about changing it. And I guess uh, Marx's uh, uh, thesis on Ferba, 11 thesis on Ferba, might be quite relevant still. Um, and of course, the, the times and periods uh, have changed, but each epoch has its own tensions and contradictions. And of course, it's a matter of question now in which ways uh, and in, 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 uh, in, uh, in which ways we engage with these social changes, in which ways 
uh, we, uh, we, we contribute this, uh, the efforts of social change is always a matter of concern for us, particularly for critical scholars, because there's always this tension between uh, theory and practice and in which ways we can bring an, uh, this theory and practice together. So this is the kind of uh, points we would like to discuss. And uh, give a very brief background, a very brief uh, discussion uh, probably will help uh, in which ways we engage with different social changes. So here I would like to refer to the current kind of dynamics that shape us, shape universities, shape academics, uh, related to, for instance, post-2008 financial crisis, uh, legitimacy crisis of neoliberal capitalism, representative democracy, shift towards authoritarian or uh, uh, pop uh, populist uh, neoliberalism and uh, how we see the consequences uh, all around the globe. And of course, we see outcomes of neoliberal check, which is a kind of rising inequality. And of course, to some extent related to some extent uh, from that, we also see the impact of climate change all around the place. And of course, right now we are experiencing a major, major pandemic, which has influenced uh, again, all around the world. So against this kind of background, what is our role? what we do, what we do, and for whom we do. So uh, this is the kind of background I would like to share. And we know that there are much more calls uh, coming for active research. And given this kind of background, now I will uh, give the stage to uh, Katya uh, to hear about her experiences, uh, her involvement and motivation, her engagement, uh, her uh, perhaps um, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, mutual dependency between research and engagement, and of course, what kind of learnings we have. Yes, Katya, the scene is yours. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thanks a lot for the nice introduction, and it's uh, great to see so many of you on uh, online. What, what a great uh, initiative this is to bring us together in this very strange uh, uh, times. So, yes, I would like to uh, start with the point that for me, kind of academia and activism uh, come together. So this is something that is uh, mutually informing and uh, uh, closely uh, connected to, to each other. Uh, and also this very connection is what makes it meaningful for me to be in, um, in academia. So, and uh, for me, this kind of engagement is probably directed at two things. So one is it changing academia uh, itself and uh, the other is being part of the broader effort for socio-ecological transformation, which is much uh, needed in view of the multiple crises that we are uh, facing. So, and I would like to share in the uh, time that I have the two kind of key engagements that I have that combine this uh, uh, academic effort and activist uh, effort together. So one is uh, uh, ephemera, an open access independent journal that I'm part of for many years now, since 2012, I think. Uh, and then the other is my uh, research and engagement in degrowth. So starting from, from ephemera, so this uh, is uh, an independent open access journal that has existed now for almost uh, uh, 20 years, uh, devoted to theory and politics in uh, organization in the broadest uh, sense of the uh, word uh, or organization. So it is quite a multidisciplinary journal and in, uh, it has been attracting uh, authors from, from different kind of uh, uh, perspectives and, uh, and different areas of um, academia and, and beyond. So I think that uh, in ephemera, we kind of do three things. And I would say that this is an example of alternative organizing within uh, academia itself. So the three things that we do is uh, one, uh, we challenge the corporate world of uh, for-profit publishers, uh, which uh, on the one hand, close knowledge uh, from uh, many people in the world and then also profiteer uh, massively uh, from it with their profits uh, being uh, quite uh, quite immense uh, and also of course they uh, these days by using all sorts of uh, uh, schemes uh, they very much benefit uh, from the public uh, funding of uh, of research so uh, so ephemera kind of presents uh, a different model uh, of, uh, of publishing, uh, which is independent and collective. So collective is this kind of uh, second uh, key thing that Ephemera does. So we are organized, it's not just an open access journal. So, and it is not 
just independent, but we are also organized collectively. And this is key to the kind of organizing practices in, uh, in ephemera. So we are about 20 people now, having started from three people, I think, uh, in 2001. And basically, we all kind of key decisions are made uh, uh, collectively in non-hierarchical uh, ways. So, and uh, then the third thing that uh, ephemera does is I think that we kind of bring this uh, interesting like uh, wholeness, let's say to academic work. So in the sense that we also challenge the division of the hierarchical division of labor within academia itself. When for example, some people engage in the more kind of intellectual uh, endeavors and have the uh, luxury to, to think, but then others do let's say more administrative uh, uh, stuff and do the, I don't know, production layout and these kinds of things uh, for the places where we publish. So in that sense, in ephemera, we kind of were engaged in both the intellectual processes and also the more boring, tedious work of production and layout. And I think that uh, there is something about it. And actually, it was a point made by uh, Peter Kropotkin, an anarchist, uh, sco um, uh, one of the founding fathers, let's say, of anarchism, uh, uh, who had this point that in Capitalism, there is a split of the, between the so-called brain and manual work, and it is a problem and the two should come together. So I think this is something that uh, we do in, in ephemera. So, and we are uh, the result of uh, these th three things we, we do um, in our kind of alternative model of uh, organizing uh, is that uh, um, the research that we are the processes that we are content with and also the research that we are um, uh, kind of uh, also content with the rigorous practices and also we have been uh, at the forefront of some of the very important I think themes in um, organization studies and beyond so for example the um, discussion of alternative organizing the discussion of anarchism as theory of organization the discussion of post growth so ephemera has been really at the forefront of kind of starting this debate in organization studies. So, and I think this is how publishing should look like. So, and I think that it's really kind of this model rather than the corporate driven model that, that uh, should be the way we uh, do things in academia. So in that sense, it is kind of trying to be a part of change within the very uh, spaces where, um, uh, where we, that we inhabit. So, and of course, yeah, there are various tensions in the sense that institutionally uh, initiatives uh, or organizations like Ephemera would not be kind of as recognized as the uh, huge publishers with the resources, but still we are very much appreciated by the readers, the authors, uh, and, uh, and many others, which uh, is why we are all uh, doing it and committed to this. So then I would like, and of course, yeah, the broader question is how to change the whole uh, system, let's say. So how to make uh, the kind of model that the family is part of the uh, way things are practiced in academia and in publishing more generally. So uh, now I would like to shift to this second kind of endeavor uh, of mine, degrowth. So degrowth is an uh, academic and activist uh, area uh, that uh, critiques growth and the centrality of growth and the centrality of economies in today's societies uh, and argues for uh, alternative reorganization of societies on the principles of ecological sustainability and social justice. So and the argument is that biophysical throughput, so the use of energy and resources should decrease while well-being should be uh, available for, uh, for everyone uh, on the uh, on the planet. And uh, the growth is a call for going away from growth uh, and also from capitalism and the kinds of principles that um, uh, the growth, let's say, uh, society or the growth uh, vision is uh, based on. There's some mutual aid uh, or uh, de democrat uh, care, democratic uh, uh, decision making and, uh, and things like this. So it is a different kind of world that the growth um, envisions. So and for me, it was something that I encountered during my uh, postdoc uh, years uh, at Lund because my 
thesis was on critical management studies and I was really kind of critical of neoliberalism in education in how corporations are so present in the university campuses, uh, how the idea of work is shaped in a very particular way that also benefits, let's say, this uh, uh, corporations. But then I was thinking, okay, how to go beyond critique and uh, into something that combines um, also an informed search for solutions. And then the growth was uh, uh, a revelation uh, and this is something that really kind of is the frame now for all the academic uh, commitments that uh, that I have, because it combines exactly uh, exactly that. So uh, and the growth is an effort to kind of stimulate uh, academic discussion in a way that is uh, critical and that calls for this uh, radical reorganization of societies. So and also in the growth there are kind of uh, efforts to organize in a way in line with degrowth principles. So for example, biennial conferences on uh, degrowth, these are not like the normal academic conferences. They always have a very strong uh, activist program, uh, artistic program, uh, and all of them traditionally finish with a demonstration. So uh, I was involved in organizing a degrowth conference here in uh, Malmo in 2018, and so together with local groups, we um, at the end uh, had a demonstration called Malmo for, uh, for Justice. And when organizing the conference for our group, it was also a way to connect to the many kind of local uh, grassroots uh, initiatives that connect uh, broadly to the growth um, ideas. So, and these connections have also stayed, so the group continues. So we have a kind of uh, local degrowth group that uh, acts, uh, uh, that uh, has many people connected to academia, but, but also it is not like an academic uh, group. And then we engage with, for example, environmental justice or climate uh, justice groups and uh, discuss kind of uh, uh, degrowth and alternatives uh, with, um, with them. So, and apart from this local uh, engagement in degrowth, there is this, uh, let's say, broader movement uh, uh, that uh, consists of uh, academics and, uh, uh, and activists, uh, and sometimes also the movement kind of unites to act uh, together. So, for example, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, unfolding, we uh, together wrote um, a collective letter kind of calling for societies for not going back to normal and for societies to be organized on different uh, principles. Um, so, and then many people also kind of signed uh, this letter and then we tried to stimulate the kind of uh, attention uh, to, uh, to this and the discussion of this. So, um, uh, and uh, then, of course, uh, one of the important discussions in the growth is how, like the many alternatives uh, or alternative organizing practices that are already out there, how to make them flourish, and then kind of the discussion of policies becomes important. So then some, some of us also try to engage as scholars with the formulation, let's say, of alternative policy proposals, so together with colleagues. For example, we have been involved in uh, contributing to a broader effort, which is the Green New Deal for Europe, which is this kind of alternative Green New Deal uh, out there, which does go away from growth and which uh, uh, is the proposal very different from what is now proposed by the, uh, by the European uh, Commission. So, and uh, I would say that it's very encouraging because there is really a lot of interest in the growth, especially from uh, young uh, people. So from, from students and from uh, activists, uh, even if it is still somewhat kind of marginal within the academic spaces. So it is hard to have like a program on the growth or a course on the growth or things, uh, things like this. Uh, and uh, of course it is explicitly political and doesn't kind of, if you are, uh, doing work on degrowth, you have this, like you take a political stance with you, which sometimes can be tricky because you can be kind of uh, um, discharged uh, as having a political uh, stance that you are speaking from. But then I think in degrowth, the very strong point uh, also complementing this political stance is that a lot of research on degrowth also draws on the kind of uh, research, let's say, in, um, in uh, ecological economics and uh, other areas, which have been really build, bringing together mounting evidence how the uh, economies uh, that are oriented towards growth are 
unsustainable and uh, destructive. So I think there is this interesting kind of uh, uh, tension, but also alliance between the two. So, and I would say that um, it is important for degrowth as a movement to build um, uh, alliances, and there has been a lot of discussion, uh, for example, of degrowth in relation to other uh, alternatives, so such as uh, alternatives to development. Uh, but also, I would say there is uh, still not enough in organization studies or critical organization studies in relation to degrowth. So this is where I see kind of a lot of uh, uh, fruitful uh, connection that um, that could unfold. Uh, and then for us engaged in the degrowth. Uh, movement, it is also important to figure out, okay, how do we organize ourselves and how do we join forces with other movements uh, for systemic uh, change? And hence, these kinds of questions of the movement have become interesting for me as also questions for my own research. So I can see how like also the, the two are mutually informing and something that is important for the activist practice becomes kind of part of the more theoretical questions that I'm thinking about. So yeah, and to uh, uh, wrap up, uh, I would say that academia and activism can be uh, mutually informing and it is uh, uh, a fruitful kind of entanglement of the uh, two. And I would say that university is a very important space for uh, making change uh, happen. Uh, and uh, yeah, I would, uh, like to encourage everyone to join this uh, effort and i will finish it here thank you thank you katya that was that was a really good uh, timing and very uh, informative uh, uh, presentation or speech uh, let's say um, <clears throat> so now uh, without losing time uh, i would like to welcome ernesto and uh, on stage to hear about uh, his own experiences and in which ways he engaged with uh, social uh, change Yes, Ernesto, we are listening to you. Yeah, thank you, Ozan, for uh, asking me to be on this panel on uh, academics and activism. Um, now, my engagement with uh, activism basically started uh, long back in 2005, uh, when the uh, Union Network International was trying to form a union with uh, ITES employees in Bangalore. At that time, I was doing some work with uh, call center employees and uh, they wanted to know from me as uh, wanted to know for me about the working conditions of call center employees in india and how they should go about forming unions so they invited me to the union uh, meeting uh, but over a period of time we had interactions with the union but the uh, the meetings were just about informing them about my research findings i was not re i really did not get involved in union formation as such at that point of time uh, uh, and unions and the union did not really take off also in this sector uh, over a period of time. Okay, and now uh, uh, in the last uh, five, six, seven years, I have been involved with an organization called Prayas, uh, which basically works in the informal sector. And they try to encourage union formation, uh, basically with agriculture workers, brickland workers, and uh, construction workers. So uh, some time back in 2008, Prayas led an agitation or with uh, certain unions, uh, also government uh, uh, representatives like police and so on to stop child labor in BD cotton farms in Gujarat. Now Gujarat is a neighboring state. The neighboring state of Gujarat is Rajasthan where child labor from Rajasthan used to migrate to Gujarat. And they used to work on these farms for two months and then go back. So there was a lot of child labor and child trafficking that was taking place in uh, on these uh, you know during this time uh, that is October November time when children used to come from uh, Rajasthan to work on on BT cotton farms BT cotton seed farms in in Gujarat. So uh, so uh, um, uh, Prayas basically intervened at that point of time. Uh, when I got engaged with Prayas, uh, basically they, they said that, you know, I should do a study to know the impact of that intervention. So they wanted us to understand, you know, in terms of uh, what, is, uh, uh, what is the amount of child trafficking that is taking place, whether child labor was still prevalent, and how, how the production is now organized. That is, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the last two, three years, has there been any change in the production process in these BT cotton farms? So uh, what we found was basically that child labor was still persistent, uh, but child trafficking had come down. 
the reason why child trafficking basically had come down because the there was a reorganization of production so previously uh, the farm the uh, uh, seed companies to tell farmers to farm in gujarat and the seeds are then produced in gujarat and then you know uh, uh, for the seed companies now what the seed companies did was because of the agitation that took place in 2008 they started moving production to the villages and the households okay of from where the child labor is to come so now what because of this it became a little bit complicated one could not distinguish between child labor and child work so there was some blurring between the uh, between child work and child labor and recently in the pandemic uh, the uh, just 10 to 10 days ago we had a meeting with the activists and they, they said that child labor had increased in rajasthan where you know in the villages of rajasthan now uh, they were they were you know in, in this uh, kind of circumstances they were trying to uh, understand how to intervene because you know more that distinction between child labor and child work had disappeared okay so we are still devising strategies and looking at uh, how do you intervene in this case where you know uh, children are working on households which belong to the community okay so so that is one thing which happened uh, during uh, this is how i got involved with this uh, particular organization pras and they they've been trying to uh, work on this issue of child labor and child uh, 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 child trafficking now uh, now besides being involved with the organization often when you are doing field work you can be you know the circumstances can lead you to a particular action for example again uh, during the pandemic i was doing some field work with construction workers and suddenly uh, you know there was this lockdown announced now given that there was a very stringent lockdown announced and it was all of a sudden so workers and people gen and people in general could not stock up commodities or stock up food okay and essentials so within two or three days of the lockdown what happened was the uh, the uh, uh, construction workers who had uh, you know been uh, doing field work with they started calling me up because they were they literally were very hungry and they said if we are if we are so if we do not have food to go uh, uh, to eat basically we will have to start walking and many of them were starting to walk back that is they were migrants from different states in india and began to walk back to their villages uh, so at that time uh, basically you, uh, since you have interface with uh, civil society organizations i i i uh, spoke to uh, some organizations and one of them janvikas uh, uh, basically said that they could provide ration to these uh, workers and therefore they they provided ration for one week during that time Uh, uh also during the time we also uh, this, since workers wanted to go back home and there were no trains and buses available there was special permission to get buses and trains you know for workers prayas again got into the picture and they were trying to arrange for buses and trains and in which some of the students uh, in uh, in the campus as well as um, some of my colleagues and myself got involved in trying to help these workers to reach reach back home okay so they this is they could be circumstances and actions when you're doing field work where you probably need to get into action these uh, interface with these kind of organizations help you to uh, 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 you know uh, help uh, or to intervene in, in these difficult times so uh, so basically uh, you know after this since we've been involved with uh, with the pandemic and helping migrant workers to get back home and also help and also providing relief for them uh we uh so these organizations child vikas and there's another organization called ajivika bureau which works with uh, migrant labor uh they have been approached by employers because some employers have felt that you know this is not the way to treat people okay so that they've been walking back home being you know killed in, in accidents and so on so they've been approached uh, and uh, since i've been also involved with them they have come up with something called the social compact now so the social compact basically means that uh, they will be uh, uh, maintaining certain labor standards in their own organizations and uh, they will also try and help workers to access the schemes that have been uh, formulated by the government so we mean also uh, so it is not only you know you're talking about uh, working with unions and ngos you're also talking about working with employers and also with the government to intervene and to uh, you know uh, uh, make the world a better place in some sense okay uh, so uh, besides this with, with my interaction with civil society organizations and uh, uh, and unions basically you know it enriches my class experience basically and so 
uh, students appreciate the uh, the understanding for example the whole uh, uh, understanding of global supply chains and the and child labor how it's linked to the bd cotton seed production and they 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 feel they it it adds value to their uh, you know uh, to the uh, to the class itself so so that's something which uh, helps me in class it enriches the class classroom discussion uh, the second thing which uh, which i can see is that the research that you do you see the impact of it you also see how uh, uh, you know uh, the you are adding you are helping people uh, you know and and propelling some kind of action which is for the betterment of people so it also uh, you feel good about it that's something which uh, that's why you probably also get involved in uh, you know or uh, interface with uh, uh, with the civil society organizations and unions uh, the whole thing sometimes the issue of objectivity is raised i think i don't think uh, besides the whole question of uh, the objectivity of research uh, being raised uh, which is uh, debatable uh, you uh, are hardly bothered about it because any organization any kind of research should be rigorous rather than you know talking about issues of objectivity and your uh, uh, in my in my experience with uh, dealing with or with doing research for civil society organizations none of them Uh, said that uh, you know there is there should be an agenda which they have and that agenda should be fulfilled they always wanted the research to be rigorous because on the basis of rig uh, rigorous research that they could uh, devise uh, some kind of action and and you know for the betterment and improvement of uh, people at large okay uh, this will be the whole thing of uh, publishing in peer reviewed journals that could be a question but i would think that a lot of work that you do with these organizations are very insightful and i think uh, there is no conflict in publishing with in peer reviewed journals as well as doing some work uh, which is you know useful to organizations uh, uh, you know uh, which are working towards the betterment of society so i i don't see any uh, conflict over there uh, of course there could be issues of workload which may uh, increase because you may have you know you may have to deal with uh, you know your, your publications for um you may have to prepare a report for the civil society organizations as well as you know then convert that into publication that could be an issue but those are issues which are manageable i and i think uh, uh, you know it's it's a very fruitful endeavor in engaging with uh, activists and uh, therefore i i'm uh, you know i am involved in this kind of uh, uh, relationship between academics and activists i think i'll stop here thanks Thank you very much Ernesto that was very insightful as well and I guess uh, <clears throat> it brings lots of discussions about the value of research for whom we do research in which ways we do research and thank you for speaking directly to the main tension points of this uh, webinar as I uh, mentioned at the beginning um <clears throat> I guess uh, it's my turn and I I would like to also uh, share my experiences about how I see activism and uh, research relationship and in which ways it benefits or it uh, mutually feeds into each other so um, I will begin with uh, actually two uh, uh, my two engagements uh, but uh, will uh, give further details about the latter one so the first engagement was uh, I'm referring to a New Zealand New Zealand context before working at the Trent University I was located in New Zealand was working for Messe University and during my post there um, uh, after uh, moving there uh, in in two years it it took some time for me to understand actually what is my role in the academy uh, and this was a kind of extension this is of course a very, very personal journey and i guess uh, many journeys are quite personal in that sense but uh, there are some uh, lessons learned that i would like to share and this is related to that so um one one initiative that i uh, began was or started was a uh, social movements conference and it began out of a very small workshop that was organized by a uh, seed funding in the university and just uh, without knowing actually new zealand context and without really knowing what's happening around and what kind of social uh, tensions and contradictions were already there uh, i invited some speakers i, I uh, issued a call and uh, there was a very much interest and different uh, policy makers different activists uh, academics who are interested in activism and social movements they all came together and then this turned into a kind of let's say a kind of major event in new zealand uh, that uh, would bring academics and activists together uh, in a row of like four years and now there was one year gap and now the fifth one is being organized 
Of course, it is. It was a collective effort. Uh, that's one thing that I will uh, emphasize uh, throughout my talk. Uh, and uh, it was it was um, simply a good engagement of a university with with activism and social movements. So I put this at, aside, and that was really important for me because this introduced me to what is really happening in in, in New Zealand context. And in relation to that, when I was trying to find a challenge that I would engage with. Um, it, I was in a small town called Palmerston North, where was the where the university was located, and uh, then I, I noted that uh, uh, there was a there was a store, uh, but it was it was it was an interesting store because people were getting in, 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 into the queue in front of it, and in the beginning I couldn't make sense, and when I was looking for some uh, local initiatives that would deal with uh, societal challenges, then the the, the the name of the organization popped up. Uh, it, it, it was called, let's, let's call it for uh, anonymity, like a uh, free food store. Uh, and uh, I did participant observation there. So that was my kind of first literally uh, engage uh, field work. And that experience has changed my understanding in regard to what, should, what my role should be. And uh, since then, actually, uh, I have been developing a kind of research agenda based on activism, based on community engagement, and particularly uh, I'm, I'm inspired by a community economies uh, model uh, developed by Gibson Graham and other colleagues. So what is, what is free food store? Uh, to give a bit background and what kind of societal challenge I try to embed. Of course, it was based on food. Uh, it was redistributing surplus food and uh, the organization was organized like a store. In the beginning of the day, they collect uh, surplus food from the retailers, from other cafes. Uh, and then during the day, there was a kind of organization of the food. Uh, it might be fresh food, it might be uh, pies, it might be yogurt, it, might, it, it, it all depends on actually the surplus uh, of, uh, of the retailers or, or, or cafes around. Um, and why it was a societal challenge? Because New Zealand is a food country. And uh, the more I spent time at free, free food store, I noted, noted that there's a huge food poverty, particularly at the child level and at the family level. And uh, this free food store was kind of meeting the needs. Of course, it is up to debate. Uh, this might be a kind of charity solution. This might be a kind of band-aid solution. Of course, I, I acknowledge these kind of issues. But apart from that, there was a kind of alternative economy, a kind of alternative community bottom-up solution. And that kind of really took my uh, attention and took my interest as a scholar. But then my interest as a scholar turned into more kind of engagement with what is really happening about food? Why there is 7% surplus, for instance, for bread? So it is inevitable. Industry level, it is accepted as 7%. So 7% per, if you produce 100 bread, then literally you count that seven, seven of them will go to waste or surplus. If you do not uh, use it sustainably, uh, either you donate uh, to these kind of organizations or you uh, sell it to uh, stock farms, uh, there's no way that you can use it. So it's literally waste. And it is kind of counted and calculated. The very uh, kind of uh, neoliberal uh, cost benefit kind of analysis is there already, a kind of market analysis is there. So this engagement also showed me in which ways free market, which is a kind of defended like a solution for decades, doesn't really work. And we have a case here in terms of that there's, there, are, there are people in need, there is much food, and free food store as a kind of community solution uh, brings these, uh, let's say, meat uh, and demand together, uh, need and demand together. Um, so that, 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 that was a kind of engagement for me uh, with a community organization. But again, at that time, I was not really sure in which way I should approach this uh, organization. It's an alternative economy, yes. Uh, it is dealing with a societal challenge, yes. But how I should make sense of it? Then I actually discovered uh, Gibson Graham uh, and uh, uh, community economies discussions and how we can think economy in a very different diverse way. And actually, this also fed into the, my understanding of activism in, in, in university. I will talk about this again. But um, so with this, with this engagement, it was like a participant observation, but it, uh, I tried to do more than that. So I literally did everything in the organization. I collect food from the retailers. I clean the store. I engage with the customers. I engage with the workers. I engage with volunteers. And meanwhile, of course, I took my notes, et cetera, et cetera, like as usual ethnography uh, or parts of the observation. 
But I tried to, once, once I realized that there is huge going on uh, behind the scenes of free in terms of lack of fair redistribution, in terms of poverty, I tried to trigger some discussions uh, amongst the community and also in my class. So I invited, for instance, the organization, uh, founder of the organization to my class uh, and the manager to discuss about why there is this amount of food and why there are such issues in regard to lack of fair distribution and how they see their organization as a community initiative. They were not political as such, but I tried to co-politicize with the involvement of the community, uh, this kind of food issues and uh, redistribution issues. Um, and also I used, uh, so similar to what Ernesto told, students found it really fascinating and they even didn't know what there was such a kind of initiative and how communities can already find some solutions, albeit limited in the market conditions, uh, they, these solutions are still there and available. So that was one kind of learning for me that to blur all these uh, categories, which are kind of taken for granted. Research is done at the university, uh, field work is part of it, but how, how actually we can really move beyond, move beyond or go beyond this kind of uh, critique done in the university and more engage with the real life happening out there. And, there was a very interesting incident, which I would like to refer here uh, to, to, to demonstrate the perception of university and academy. Uh, when I was working with a colleague there, one day the colleague called, told me that uh, we were just repackaging the food. And she told me that you are different. You are not like the other academics uh, on the other side of the city. So physically, indeed, the university was at the outskirts of the city and uh, the river was passing between. and um, she, was, she, she was actually telling us that you, you academics are there doing something, okay, but you are not here, you are not with us. And that was one kind of aha moment for me that, okay, maybe we should really reconsider the role of the university, the role of academy, the role of critical scholarship. It is fine, we engage with this kind of uh, initiatives, but what we can do more. And then this, this uh, also, you know, uh, triggered my uh, interest more further about how I can do more. And of course, um, there are some learnings here in regard to uh, in regard to my engagement with the free food store. So the first one is um, there are ways to engage with grant challenges, although at the local level. And of course, they might be limited, but in a way, we can do some modest uh, impact, or particularly for those people, for those communities. Of course, like advocacy, like uh, writing reports for them, etc. But perhaps we can do more. And this is actually where I try to develop a kind of more broader framework. Uh, why don't we think a kind of new academy, a kind of academic uh, activist academy, activist scholarship that would bring the university to the city? Uh, is in the case of metaphorically talking, of course, to my previous experience, in which ways we can really bring uh, university resources and the, 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 uh, the um, let's say, to some extent, privileges of the university to the needs of, the, of these kind of communities. To some extent, many of us already have been doing that, but perhaps we need to think in a more perhaps radical and critical way uh, and not kind of uh, prioritize uh, uh, what neoliberal university asks from us. So I'm kind of trying to shift uh, and change the understanding in regard to the expectations of neoliberal university versus what the community and the society asks for, and in which ways we can be critical and concise uh, of these kind of engagements and uh, these kind of initiatives. So. Um, that, that was also one of the, for instance, education uh, part of the Education Act in, in New Zealand. And that was a very powerful position for the scholar that the, the university can act as the critic and conscience of uh, the society. So how can we bring this into the city, into the communities, and in which ways we can uh, do more, uh, apart from putting our in, labor into that uh, community, uh, in which ways we can uh, learn from them, in which ways we can work with them, uh, in which ways we can uh, perhaps expand and uh, yeah, make, make, make solutions uh, scale up. So these are the kind of tensions and challenges. Of course, there is not a kind of recipe or there is not a kind of easy solution for all these kind of engagements or all the contradictions. Because in my engagement, I also realized that, of course, inevitably, 
um, in the beginning of my field work, we, we speak a different language with, 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 the, with these communities. Their, their needs, their priorities are completely different than us. And then that was another kind of aha moment for me. We really need to be there in order to understand what is happening there, what kind of issues and challenges they experience and in which ways we can uh, be part of their journey. And meanwhile, maybe we can also share uh, our findings and learnings. So instead of putting research ahead, I'm putting actually activism ahead. And then I would say that research can follow or to put it more perhaps uh, fancy that I would say it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of praxis that how we can bring research and uh, activism together align with it. So these are kind of my learnings uh, from, uh, exp from my engagement experience. And with this, I am now moving toward more kind of um, an attempt for redefining scholarship, redefining academy, particularly with a focus on activism. And then perhaps more emphasis on maybe advancing uh, action research more in the form of working with and for activist communities or for communities who are already dealing with uh, societal challenges within their own scope, within their own scale, uh, and how we can learn and expand uh, these uh, engagements. And currently, uh, for instance, in, in, in the Netherlands, after all these kind of experiences, uh, with, 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 with the challenge of learning a language, uh, with the challenge of trying to understand a new country and also new challenges, uh, we try to build a new network with these kind of communities who are um, offering an, an alternative uh, sustainable uh, framework. So, um, this is, the, this is what I learned. This is what I practice right now. And uh, I take it also as a kind of uh, a challenge for neoliberal university. Of course, I am bounded with it. Of course, I still uh, try, to, uh, try to negotiate with the demands and other things. But uh, I believe that similar to the Gibson Graham's diverse economies framework, I believe that all the university uh, might be, although academy might be quite neoliberal or there might be quite dominant neoliberal practices, there are still some gaps and spaces where we can utilize and where we can use. And this is what I rely on. And of course, we have a huge uh, historical uh, background in that sense. Uh, university might be perceived like ivory tower, some people doing something out there, but actually we are not, we are not doing this. We are doing something different and we can actually utilize the resources of the university and the academy for, for the benefits of the communities and for the benefits of uh, this kind of critical radical uh, if, if you can find some engagements. So these are, these are kind of my uh, uh, experiences I would like to share. And uh, to, to, to conclude before uh, giving word to Daniel, um, each, each journey is personal and there is no right or wrong here uh, as a, as a, as a, uh, from my personal view. Uh, but I believe that there is much we can do uh, and there is much uh, possibilities out there but of course, it's always a challenge. It's always a tension, but we can challenge that. That's, that is, that's what we can do as academics. And uh, as I said, we have this historical tradition behind us. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, and now I, will, uh, I would like to give a uh, word to Daniel uh, to hear about uh, his experiences and about his learnings. And uh, Padlet is also, as far as I can see, uh, going really well. Yes, Daniel, we are listening to you. Great. Okay. And thank you very much, Ozan. Um, and thank you very much for organizing this as well. Um, Ozan talked a bit about his own personal experiences, and I just wanted to reflect a few things um, on mine. Um, and really, my interest in all of this started from um, when I was doing my undergraduate degree and when I first was sort of confronted with critical management studies. So I was, um, I worked in a building society on my um, placement year for my degree. And I remember um, experiencing some of that and seeing what the um, my fellow employees were going through and some of the um, the tensions and the difficulties. And as I was really confronted by that, by um, my first time of reading critical management studies and really thinking, well, what would Hugh Wilmot do in this situation? And that was really my first set of trying to work through this about being embedded in the world and then being hit by critical perspectives and being challenged by them, but thinking, well, what would you actually do that's different? What would you do that's practical? And really trying to work through that, um, those types of questions. 
And after I started my after I did my degree, I set up a small um, therapeutic arts organisation. Um, I became, I guess, radicalised in my perspectives. Knew that the sort of business career I guess I had thought I was going to take on, I wanted to do something that I believed led to um, greater sense of social change. So I ran a um, therapeutic arts organisation. And whilst doing my PhD at the same time. And then I remember coming back, being really quite excited at the end of one session. I'd done um, quite a lot of good work, I thought, in that session, and we managed to hit some of the targets. It was um, quite a, a stressful time in terms of running this small um, voluntary organisation. And then reading Foucault and, again, being completely challenged, but from another point of view and really finding some of the work Foucault was doing, the things that I thought I was doing that was really good and positive, um, and being challenged by those perspectives as well, and really confronting my own experience. And my my um, PhD um, pivoted quite strongly at that point from being um, sort of having the voluntary sector in the background to really critiquing my own everyday um, practices within um, the voluntary sector, and really becoming interested in the idea of managerialism. And realizing that you can't just change individual organizations, um, you need something a little bit more systemic. So being involved in some campaigns around managerialism in the voluntary sector, trying to engage with a series of activists, writing pamphlets um, and various other things like that. Um, and finding some really positive things, the amount of time and the space and the resources that Ozan um, quite rightly pointed and some of the uh, fellow speakers have pointed at as well, but also some of the difficulties that come with that, some of the different um, languages and the different assumptions that we're working to as well really came through. Um, and feeling a little bit, when trying to do that, a bit disconnected from practice, so then getting involved in some um, small scale voluntary organisations and um, trying to work towards democratising and being really interested in the everyday managerial practices and how do we embed those, how do we make those work as well. Um, so one of the attempts that uh, I myself with Chris Land made was working with a small scale organisation which had in its uh, infancy been a radical anarchist group um, and then they got some funding and became quite um, formalised and um, commercialised in a sense and trying to bring them back to their democratic roots but really struggling with some of the challenges that that um, emerged. And my more recent experiences, I'm now um, running quite a large project on the impact of COVID on the voluntary sector as well and really trying to um, challenge some of the ways that voluntary sector organisations are run at this time. And I just want to reflect a bit. So that's sort of in a way about the motivations and what I'm trying to do and why um, those things, but also the, the possibilities and challenges, one of the things that Ozan asked us to reflect on. And I think um, all the speakers have alluded to this, but we, I think, are in a very privileged position. You know, we have lots of time, we have resources, in a sense, you know, that we're being squeezed as well with teaching and many other things, particularly this term. I don't know how others have found it, but I've personally found that quite challenging. Um, at the same time, we also do have greater freedom than I think many people have got. Um, so I think one of the things we can really think about, we often think about the, the challenge and the difficulties, but also the privileges and the possibilities that we have. Um, my, my experiences of, I, you know, this is entitled about activism, and I've always felt a little bit um, uncomfortable with that as a phrase. I feel much more comfortable with the idea that I'm engaged scholar trying to engage often with activists but with other people as well um, but really also being at the boundaries of when is this research when is this my own activism um, and the and the blurring of those identities I think is a particularly interesting and challenging set of things and one of the things at times I got really involved um, where I live in a an activist community and really gave over sort of six to nine months of my life really um, working a lot uh, my my actual paid employment really went down in terms of what I was trying to produce at that time. Um, but then reflecting on sort of that tension to go, you know, jack in almost the academic stuff and really focusing on that. But in conversations with Martin Parker, he was sort of, he told me, which sort of affronted me a little bit, but at the same time really made me reflect that part of our role is also to step back and to do that reflective work as well. 
And so what I've tried to do is, and this is, I think, the, the possibilities of engaging is you really, and some of the, um, all three of the speakers before, I think, have alluded to this as well. By being engaged, by being active, we learn enormous amounts of things about what's possible, what's feasible, what we can do, what we can't do, where the boundaries are for, um, for change as well. And so really being at that sort of forefront of trying to explore and challenge those things deepens I hope our theoretical work as well. So I don't see necessarily there's a conflict between our academic work and our um, engagement, but it's really trying to think, well, what is it that we bring that's useful and productive? And I think that's where we really need to think most about. You know, there's a lot of talk at the moment about being engaged, but that alone to my mind doesn't quite work because um, really what we've got to think is what is it that the things that we bring that are unique to this situation. And I think some of that is that in between stage by being within a university, but also trying to engage as well. Some of it is about trying to, we have certain resources, both financially, time, intellectual resources as well. We have the possibilities of speaking on behalf of others, but also engaging and um, amplifying voices of others as well. We bring a degree of social capital, I suppose, in those situations. It opens up doors that others don't have, but also sometimes it's excludes as well. I know some of the um, engagement I've had with activist group, I did some work with Patrick Reedy a few years ago um, in my own community, but he very much seemed to be shut out because they were very suspicious of um, him as an academic coming into those situations as well. So I think we've also got to be realising that we may think we have alliances with some groups, but that may not necessarily be the case as well. Um, but I think there's a lot we can work sometimes with that tension, with those anxieties, with our own sense of identity um, as we do that. So I think going back to that experience I had as an undergraduate and trying to think, well, what is it that critical management studies can do? Can it solve some of those problems? And I think, quite frankly, we're not in that position and it doesn't have so many normative positions and probably nor should it. It is an opportunity for reflection, for engagement. But my interest at the moment really is around workplace democracy and really thinking about the everyday micro practices of organising and trying to use that to challenge um, my own thinking and others as well. Um, but also my experience of working with um, a number of activist groups, community organisers, etc., is that they are also incredibly engaged and knowledgeable about lots of the literature that we've worked with as well. So, you know, it's not as much as we're going in and then showing them our great critical insights and telling them what to do. I think it's mostly my my experience has been one much more of humility of learning from them and maybe taking some things through. And I think that's probably more attitudinally the perspective I've developed over the last few years as well. So I think my sort of summary would be about the, the great amount of learning we can do theoretically, um, intellectually, where we think then critical management studies can be involved in working around these everyday practices. And to my mind, then that's why I'm now interested in um, organisational governance, uh, workplace democracy and different forms of organising, but not with the view that these are necessarily full solutions for everything, but more trying to look at the possibilities embedded in the everyday. And that's, to my mind, where critical management studies um, can be taken in the sort of the next stage of that. So I'm going to stop talking there. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thanks also for reflecting uh, the other questions and other uh, uh, comments and views. Um, um, yeah, lovely. I mean, we have heard just a very brief wrap up and then probably we will move into question and answer. I, I note that there are uh, questions coming and um, I, would, I will try to uh, collectivize these questions if you do not mind so that everyone can uh, put their views here. Um, but uh, as a wrap up, uh, Ekaterina mentioned about, uh, or Katya mentioned about her engagement with uh, Ephemera Journal as an alternative critical publishing experience as a form of activism and also his, uh, her engagement with the growth movement. Uh, and so particularly for child labor, child birth conditions and how these, uh, these there are blurring boundaries, blurring lines there and how academics can engage with this kind of burning issues uh, in which forms and how uh, in different, uh, with different organizations, academics can play a significant role there for social change purposes. 
Um, I particularly would like to emphasize, uh, based on my previous experiences, how academics can play a role again here to become a bridge uh, between academia and activism and how activism may lead research to some extent. But of course, um, uh, it, it's, it's a form of praxis, a kind of theory and practice alignment, uh, uh, I would say. And finally, Daniel, uh, by building on, on these discussions and by uh, reflecting on her, her, his own experiences, uh, how academics should uh, act quite modest and with, uh, with, with some humility to learn from activist communities and how the roles uh, are not taken for granted, uh, both in academy and also both in activist communities. Uh, I hope I do a fair wrap up uh, for all the, all the speakers, which was quite interesting and uh, dense. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to share some questions. And um, so feel free, uh, all our panelists, uh, to jump in. So um, one is about, uh, I guess, um, should, we, should we have uh, activist activities uh, different from our research? Would this be fruitful? So should we kind of separate uh, activist uh, orientation, individual activist orientation and uh, individual research practices? That's one question. And uh, maybe we can have a five minutes, 10 minutes round for this question. Yes, uh, any views on that? Yes, Ernesto, please go ahead, or Daniel. Go on, Nessie. It is muted, Ernesto. Okay, then Ernesto first, Daniel uh, second. Okay, uh, I would think that, uh, you know, it's it's very difficult to uh, separate the two in the sense that you, you your activism and uh, academics, you know? So when you when you're involved with an organization, probably you uh, you also are working with them, and as Daniel said, probably you're also learning from them. And uh, this, I, I would also think that the learnings that you get from them is often also could be applied to your own workplace. You know, things that you that activists do in a broader society could also apply to the workplace. And in a way, uh, you would also be an activist in your own organizations when when there are certain infringements, for example. With regards to labor issues, in, in at least in my context. Yeah, Daniel. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing about separating um, your work and um, your research is a really interesting one. I guess, to my mind, part of it would be um, thinking: well, what is the value that we give when we are engaged um, in doing that research as well? And where where is um, where does our academic work? Um, come in so I don't think you always have to I think that's obviously it's a personal decision but quite often I think the opportunities to get engaged is a way of testing out and exploring and thinking and challenging your own sense of assumptions and perspectives as well so to my mind part of that work would be about um, engaging in such a way that you can explore and challenge your own assumptions um, part of it as well I think is about trying to um, is to learn from others, as I said, that's to my mind, a big part of um, engaging. Um, I'm working with a number of different organizations at the moment, interested in sociocratic forms of organizing, um, forms of workplace democracy. And I know theoretically how things sit, but I think it's only by being engaged, or perhaps not only, but one of the ways of really uncovering some of those challenges is to be engaged and to explore those and to try to um, be in that in between space. And I think one of the nice things as well, one what I've realised for myself is there's patterns where I'm quite intensely engaged. And then there's that process of withdrawing as well, which then leads me to reflect deeper on those experiences. And I mean, there was talk a little bit earlier about whether then that means career-wise, whether we've got challenges or not. And I don't necessarily think there has to be attention because there is opportunities for us to then do some research to um, get published and to question, you know, to think deeper. And that's really where we add value as academics as well is that deeper theoretical space. So to my mind, you don't always have to obviously bring, you know, those two things together. But when you do, it's thinking, well, what is the value that I give as an academic to this space? And it may well be, that we're learning and we're taking some of those ideas elsewhere um, or we can step back and do that reflection and sometimes it's simply that we've got I know some of the organizations I worked with a number of years ago now but where I live 
is I had the time and the resources to write the web pages to um, to do some of the marketing to do to get involved in some of that community organizing as well. Um, to to even like just do the everyday things, you know, put away chairs and help arrange tea and coffee or whatever it might be. And let's also you know, they probably aren't saying, well, can you give me your latest reading of Foucault? They probably really want practical everyday things as much as the theoretical contribution. Great, thank you, Daniel. And uh, there's actually a question uh, related to all of us, but particularly addressed to some extent, Ekaterina, given uh, her engagement with Ephemera. Um, what actions uh, do we advise junior scholars take in order to follow the example of Ephemera and continue to challenge the, the, for, the for profit publishing system? And I guess this is relevant to many of us as academics, <laughs> given uh, our engagement with publishing. Yes, Ekaterina what, what, or Katya, what, what can you say? Yeah, thanks for this question. So I would say that uh, contribute to the alternative outlets uh, like uh, ephemera that already exist. So then find ways of perhaps starting your own uh, initiatives of this uh, kind, because there should be uh, more, uh, I think. So uh, yeah, so this would be kind of the, the two ways to, to contribute to what is already there and, and start your, your own and kind of use your uh, interest and creative energy to uh, mobilize together with uh, others. I also would like to just uh, rain, uh, encourage that. And uh, as, a, as a, I'm also part of uh, Ephemera Collective and um, yeah, just, just, just push the boundaries, I would say. Pushing the boundaries might be one of the ways. And of course, it's not an easy uh, decision, but there are, there are always these spaces, I guess. That's one of the, one of the uh, argument I would just uh, add uh, to Katya's. Um, any other publishing related uh, comment uh, from Daniel or Ernesto? I'm going to do a plug, <laughs> which I've already put on the Padlet. Um, but we've got the first of our books about um, our organising and activism book series. So this is the first one with Thomas Swan, which is a lovely book, really, really nice. Um, so obviously, great Christmas stocking fillers for those of you who need to go out and buy those. Uh, no, but seriously, we've got, I put the link on the, on the Padlet as well. Um, and I know some people um, involved in this webinar are involved in um, developing manuscripts as well, but we're really hoping that that's a space that people can, um, again, sort of alternative forms of publishing and get books out. We're trying to keep the prices very reasonable as well, because normally academic books in hardback are astronomically expensive, which always seems ironic when we're writing about activism and then have a pricing structure that excludes um, the same said activists. So I think that that series, that's what we're trying to push the boundaries of. We're really interested in building up that series as well. So I've put my email address in the um, in the chat. I think the other thing I just say on, on publishing is that you know sometimes people feel it's a bit of a contradiction. And I've my experience has been that actually publishing has given me more space. Certainly the way my university works, you get research hours by the outputs that you give, and that that can have a positive um, effect because it then means that then that gives me a bit more space to get involved in community projects as well. I realize that comes with contradictions and tensions and difficulties um, as we go through, but I don't necessarily see that they have to be, uh, don't have to decide necessarily between the two. What I'm, the way I'm seeing it more increasingly is you just have phases when you're engaged and then phases maybe where you can withdraw and really think through theoretically what the things have come out and maybe that's a way of balancing um, my academic identity and my other identities as well um, but it's yeah there's always going to be tensions there but I do think we um, by not writing up and by not trying to think those things through we sometimes do ourselves a disservice as well and that is one of the it is a core part of our role is to be trying to think in a deeper um, way around these things so to my mind um, publishing in lots of places, ephemera is fantastic, um, there's, but lots of journals have got spaces for this as well as, as many other, and blogs and other things. And that's the final thing I say as well, trying to do, I wrote this paper with my PhD student who was, um, who ran a um, anarchist group in Greece and said that he had lots of researchers saying, can we come and research you? And they used to say, well, read our website first, find out about us first, get engaged with us first, and then what do we get out of it? And his experiences I found really telling as well, that we've got to be thinking, well, 
they're not sitting there wanting critical scholars to come along and spend time with them. What are we giving back as part of that? Um, and maybe some of it might just be everyday, very practical things as well. And certainly I learned a lot by looking at um, radical geographers. Um, you know, you've mentioned Gibson Graham earlier. I think Paul Chatterton and others are fantastic as well. So, yeah, there's a whole load of people like that that'd be interesting to see. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. I, I just want to emphasize the, 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 the point that, you know, working with and for communities, I guess, a way to go in a way by learning from each other and by co-producing knowledge each other instead of uh, having some taken for taken for granted assumptions about as you as you rightly point out that whether these people are not just waiting for us to be critically analyzed and <laughs> simply uh, we, it's a matter of how how we how we engage them and how we know them and in which ways we can also contribute to their cause. Um, following that, uh, we refer to uh, more outside of academy kind of engagement, uh, but also there's a really nice question which uh, is related to all of us, I guess. Um, and I will directly read the question from uh, Greg Bamber uh, from uh, Australia. Um, this is a great webinar, thanks. I wonder if any of the speakers might like to reflect on academics and activism, engaging with or trying to promote positive changes in their own institutions more ethical forms of management, greater diversity and more equality for transparency of decision-making, et cetera. That's, I think, a very fair question. Uh, once we kind of discuss about our kind of outside engagements and how we bring outside into the university, but of course, university is not a kind of a rose garden with lots of tensions, with lots of conflicts, with lots of multiple logics, let's say, you know, uh, publish or perish, uh, social impact, engagement, and of course, there are other power dynamics in terms of, for instance, intersectionality, in terms of gender, in terms of representation. So what uh, can you say? Uh, Kathy, would you like to say something? Yes, so I think definitely academia is the space to, to kind of um, promote the changes. And also it is in line with, I don't know, the, the idea of uh, prefiguration. So to kind of try and create the kinds of uh, practices in your own spaces that uh, are part of the change, broader change that you want to see. And then, of course, the I guess it depends on the positions that we have in our different uh, uh, institutions and kind of uh, what we can do and what we, we cannot. But I think that from yeah, small things to larger things, we should keep doing it. I have this kind of small example that I found interesting at some point when uh, uh, a person was, was doing an internship uh, and I was the supervisor so it was an academic internship within the university and then basically when I was to fill in the form of this internship it was so corporately framed so you could really see that the all the questions there about skills and stuff so they were about being applicable to the corporate world and then I really didn't know what what to do and kind of how to address this because I, I couldn't really uh, evaluate the uh, internship experience of the person working uh, with me in those terms. So, but then I was wondering, okay, would it actually kind of be uh, not so nice for me to bring this up? Would it maybe uh, kind of hurt her in some way? So, and then on speaking with her about it, uh, we decided that I would bring up the issue with this form to this department where she was based that I didn't know so, so much. And then it was so interesting because I found a lot of sympathetic uh, or not a lot of, but some sympathetic people there. So the person who was uh, in charge of this uh, form was uh, absolutely kind of reacting to it and saying, yeah, we will, we will change it because we just didn't have the time to, uh, to do things uh, about it, but it's definitely not the way we would like to evaluate the internships within the university. So a small example, but it was a nice kind of change, but there are bigger ones we can contribute to also. Yeah, I just want to add uh, personally, for instance, we are also trying to bring activism into academy by a master's program. That's what we are currently working at the Trek University School of Governance. And uh, with this, actually, we try to create a kind of node, a central node where critical ideas uh, can come together, not uh, only in a, uh, from a research perspective, but also from an uh, education perspective. Um, Ernesto, would you like to add anything, uh, given your experience in the university? Then I have another question. Yeah, so uh, as I said earlier, you know, basically what you learn from the practice in the, with uh, interaction with civil society organizations, you can, you can bring it back to your own organization. 
for example you know uh, when you are dealing uh, like in in our organization the structure such that we also part we also are part of the administrative kind of structure so you have spaces where you can intervene okay so for example if there is uh, issues of minimum wages or issues with regard to contract labor and the type of contracts that they sign you can intervene and uh, certainly make a difference over there so uh, so this I, I, as i said you know this helps me uh, uh, very often you know to intervene with issues of uh, especially with issues of uh, you know housekeeping staff or security guards and so on you know so so you can uh, certainly raise the labor standards of these uh, of these people and uh, of, of 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 the workers and therefore uh, i would certainly think that you know it's not that you need to just do everything outside the organization you can also do a lot of things within the organization and since you know and, and in the interaction with activists you know also how to go about doing it Thanks. yeah thank you thank you anna so i guess uh, it's a really good point that we have also spaces and places in the university where we can intervene into say, these kind of dynamics uh, power dynamics and power relations particularly in committees uh, of course there are some other issues uh, whether they are effective or not but there are these spaces where we can intervene um, i think i'm coming to the last question uh, particularly addressed to daniel uh, but uh, i think this is a fair question to all of us uh, who are trying to promote activism uh, in in and outside uh, university um, uh, Daniel, uh, this is from Kate Kenny. Um, uh, she's asking, uh, can you speak about activist education outside the university structure where fees are a big barrier to activists outside middle class? Have you been involved and whether you have any ideas? Yeah, um, I think it's a really interesting question. Be, I don't know if other panelists have got some views as well on this. Um, I guess my experience mostly of doing this type of work has been um, when I was doing my PhD, I ran that therapeutic arts organization, which was based on the sort of assumptions of Paolo Freire and Augusta Boal as well. So Boal, I mean, many people are probably very familiar with um, Freire, but Boal's work took the pedagogy of the oppressed and looked at theater of the oppressed. So working with people with drug addiction, mental health, etc. cetera. Um, so there's a lot of community organizing that takes many of the traditions that we work with in critical management studies and utilizes them in quite strong ways. And so some of my experience has been utilizing those types of um, uh, workshops and those types of methodologies in those types of spaces as well. Um, and I think part of it as well is then been trying to um, sort of embed that process in any sort of engaged research that I do. So not necessarily directly using free area and sort of um, pedagogy techniques, but certainly um, a lot of the community organisations I've been involved with, that, that sort of ethos has been very much at the heart of of what they're saying as well. And just to quickly go back to the previous discussion um, about our own institutions, and I think some of it is just, and I liked uh, Ernesto's point about the spaces of possibility and just thinking, well, where can we bring in um, these types of principles? And certainly within the research center that I run, then I try to think these things through, but of course you're always caught within the in institutional structures that you're working in as well. So I think part of our role is to try to push those spaces and where we can use them. And often when you're speaking up with a shaky voice is part of, I guess there's no point speaking up unless it is with a shaky voice. That's where the power is being challenged at those times as well. Um, but certainly there's lots of times where I don't do that. Um, because I think we all have to pick the right battles as well. But um, yeah, I don't know if other other panelists have been involved in community forms of organising or other things using that sort of um, community participatory approaches or others that would answer Kate's really interesting point. I can mention that, that when living in uh, Leicester, uh, we organised Leicester People's uh, University at the time, which was a space to have this kind of uh, collective discussions on pressing issues in a participatory uh, way with someone having some sort of uh, expertise on the topic, whether academic or activist, and then others joining for an open discussion. And then I must also say that in the Swedish context where, uh, where I am now, of course, there are quite a lot of like 
institutional spaces that um, create the possibilities for this. So there are many ways also to get uh, education outside the university. So there are kind of this uh, uh, folk hoax scholars, so kind of people's uh, education. There are also uh, workers, uh, there is a workers education association, which is open to different uh, initiatives and can create as a space for kind of uh, to host different activist groups, but also for these groups to organize things. And I would say also the universities, I mean, it probably depends on the context, but also uh, uh, my university is very active in having all sorts of events that um, kind of go beyond academia and which are open to many. So we have the future week, the sustainability week, and these kinds of things, which then really bring a lot of people on the academic and activist uh, sites uh, together and connect to the, to the community. So, so yeah. Okay, I got a very interesting question actually, which is related to some other questions and uh, probably that, this will be the last one uh, in terms of timing. Um, so for instance, I am from Turkey uh, and uh, there are some countries who are governed under some, you know, let's say with some strong management, let's say in a very political way, uh, or there are some other issues in terms of uh, being activists or how to give voice or how to engage with some different groups in the society. And the question is, in this kind of countries, in this kind of contexts, and of course, to some extent, neoliberal violence can be discussed at various countries, but let's say there are extremes and there are there's a spectrum here. But let's say in these kind of countries where we see this uh, pressure upon academics, upon universities, how can academy and activism can come together? That's a very good question, I would say. Uh, and I wonder, uh, particularly beginning perhaps from Ernesto because he's smiling, uh, maybe we can hear uh, some views from Ernesto and then um, Daniel and uh, Ketern. And, and also, of, of course, I can also uh, provide some reflections. And I think you're the best person to ask, answer that question. I was just smiling because, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is an issue probably in many other countries too. <clears throat> including probably India. Okay, um, so I've been dealing with labor issues, so I don't think I face that kind of, uh, we are not facing that kind of backlash, but it can, you, uh, one cannot say that when it could, when uh, that could happen, okay? But there are uh, academics who are involved in other issues of uh, the community uh, or uh, organizations and uh, when, which are more political, and I think uh, they do face these issues also in India. So now, how do we deal with it? <laughs> That's in the sense in, in my context, so far I've not really experienced this. I don't know uh, how to go about it, but I, I, I know it's a very difficult situation and probably at some point of time, maybe you will have to take an individual call on what you should be doing. So I would... Thanks, thanks Ernesto, thank you. Um, any, any other comments about this? Yeah, I, I, I would just add, you know, the, each country has its kind of specifics and it is not, a, it is not, it's not really easy, even, even for basic democratic rights, people lose their jobs, lose their uh, lives, uh, and even they can uh, have really uh, difficult situations. And of course, just by sitting here and just giving some advice would not work out, but um, simply, I guess, uh, we can just uh, defend our ideals uh, with the ways we can and uh, with the research we do, with the teaching we do. Uh, and I know that sometimes even these can be punished, uh, but I guess these are the only tools we have as academics. And these are the things we can uh, engage with. Um, and. I agree with Ernesto, it's a very difficult situation and I, I, I do not have a really proper answer apart from saying that we can just stick with our own values and try to uh, live up to them. Uh, with this, maybe we are coming to the end and uh, I wonder whether there might be one final comment from uh, speakers or would like to add anything else. Okay, all right then. Uh, it was a great webinar, I would say. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, for all the speakers. Uh, in terms of order, Katya, uh, Ernesto, Daniel, uh, thank you for sharing uh, reflections. Thank you for sharing your learnings. 
uh, and thank you for your time, even in this very busy time. Uh, so I, I hope that we could present some diverse way of engagement with social change in an outside academy and people can uh, just get their own views on that or on their practices uh, on that. Uh, and also I would like to, of course, thank to uh, my team, let's say CMS in touch, uh, uh, at the, behind the scenes, many things are going on and I just want to uh, appreciate and acknowledge the whole effort here. Uh, and thanks also for those who are putting their input on the Padlet into the chat. Uh, we would like to keep this conversation going, of course, in, in different uh, outlets in, um, uh, of course, in drone contributions on uh, Padlet. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, and of course there are streams, uh, as far as I can see, on uh, in, in egos, uh, or there are some special issues are coming. So yeah, let's let's keep the conversation going. And uh, thanks again for all the contribution. And with this, I leave scene to uh, Kat. Thanks so, uh, thanks so much, Ozan, and thank you so much to Daniel Ernesto and Katarina for such a fantastic uh, 90 minutes. Um, I feel fully nourished and also ready to go. And I think Daniel's call to to speak up with shaky um, with shaky voices has really kind of resonated with me in thinking about what I can personally do as well as what we can collectively do. Um, so before we leave, I'd just like to say thank you so much for for joining us. Before you go back to uh, back to the the grind, and uh, the next event we have is going to be an absolutely fantastic event. It's um, with Sarah, uh, Sarah Stuckey, who's going to be organising it. And there's going to be a discussion with Paul Adler and a panel looking at his book, Building a 99% uh, Economy, about democratic socialism in the US. And um, so please join us for that. The date's not decided, but if you join us at the event page, Eventbrite page, if you sign up to the Eventbrite page, you'll be notified of registration. I will also be tweeting it as well when we when we get a date as well. And finally, if you're interested in running a in touch webinar, a workshop, or a community support session in whatever form you want, just uh, drop us an email on cmswebinars at gmail.com and uh, we'll start the conversation and hopefully we can develop with you as fantastic a session as we've had uh, here today. Um, so in the meantime, thank you. Keep on posting on Padlet and uh, hopefully we'll be seeing you at the next uh, CMS In Touch session. Bye for now. <laughs>